someone who would hide. He would face up to things. That's enough of the beast, who's not very beastly anymore. How about some sex? In a liberal age, nothing about sex is deviant, unless it hurts someone else who hasn't agreed to be hurt. And then if they have, it's masochism. And if it's you who's doing it, it's sadism. When I kneel down and pray at this special altar, designed for special services of a strictly non-religious kind, I'm acting out a ritual of blasphemy that goes back many centuries, which the Marquis de Sade, a unique philosopher-pornographer, made into the basis of his life's work. In the late 18th century and the early 19th, de Sade wrote books on perversion, cataloguing every obscenity his imagination could produce. They were called things like Philosophy in the Bedroom and 120 Days of Sodom. My black the settings were castles, rich houses, and of course monasteries and churches, all the favorite fantasy venues for porny goings on. Of course, there's nothing philosophical about this theme park brothel in New York and its fiberglass walls. It's just the usual fantasies. Doctors and nurses in this room. Mmm, nice speculums. What is the purpose of life? Desaad asked. Happiness, he answered, and for others to be less happy. That was ecstasy for him, an ecstasy whiteout. This is the key to the Marquis de Sade's home in Provence, in the south of France. An ancient chateau on the top of a lonely hill. Chateau Lacoste. De Sade lived here with his wife and children during the run-up to the French Revolution. It was the historical moment of progress and rationalism, which was about to become the moment of romanticism and of deviation. Through these once beautifully furnished corridors and rooms walked de Sade and his lovely wife, Renee, caring and thoughtful and faithful toward her husband until the day she died. And also their servants and butlers, who de Sade would hire from the nearby town, and put to use up here in lovely orgies and parties. Sometimes their fathers would come round and try and shoot him, or the police would come by and try and arrest him. There'd be dawn raids and daring escapes and de Sade running around the south of France in disguise. This was pretty much what he did for the first half of his life until his mid to late thirties. The second half, and he lived to age 74, he was in prison virtually all that time, nearly 30 years. And in prison, he wrote. The first half of his life, he was occupied with orgies. The second half, he was occupied with writing about them, thinking about them, philosophizing. In Dissard's philosophy in the bedroom, a 15-year-old virgin is introduced to perversion by some aristocratic libertines and immediately becomes hooked. The story is one big orgy. The other main characters include Dissard and a priest called de Chevalier, who is horrified by all the transgression. There's beautiful nature outside the castle. The romantics love nature, but de Sade said that cruelty is the first sentiment imprinted into us by nature. The orgy is going on around them, getting more and more horrible, more and more outrageous and cruel, now with a spot of uh, daughter-on-mother anal rape. And de Sade wants to explain to Chevalier that heaven is just a construct made up by man to explain the awesomeness of nature. And good and bad, the system that heaven stands for, is merely a great big hypocritical system. He says, the miracles, rather the physical effects of this mother of the human race, nature, differently interpreted by men, have been deified by them under a thousand forms, each more extraordinary than the other. Cheats and intriguers, abusing their fellow's credulity, have propagated their ridiculous daydreams, and that is what the Chevalier calls heaven. That is what he fears offending. Humanity's laws are violated, he adds, but the petty stuff and nonsense in which we are indulging ourselves this afternoon. 
Get it into your head once and for all, my simple and very faint-hearted fellow, that what fools call humaneness is nothing but a weakness born of fear and egoism, that this chimerical virtue enslaving only weak men is unknown to those whose character is formed by stoicism, courage, and philosophy. It's heavyweight stuff. It's full of intellectualism. It's not even really written for pawny pleasure. In fact, it's all a disguised attack on anyone in charge. God, the king, the law. In between cruelties, the characters discuss Sardian ideas of social revolution. Down with parental authority. No more enslaving of wives by husbands. Plus, sexual pleasure shall be the main motivation in life. All this sounds just like the normality of today. Liberal attitudes towards marriage and family life, and nothing but mindless sex on TV. I'm going to have a rest now and try some French cuisine. I'm sure I'll be safe from depravity in here. Oh, no! Welcome back. This program is going swimmingly. It's all about evil. Only in this last part, it's half about good. Because now I'm going to look at the split personality that everyone has. They've got the good and the bad in equal measure. At least according to the Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung, who is going to be our spiritual guide now. This is Jung's old stone tower on a lake near Zurich. It was his retreat to get back to the primitive, natural level of existence, to balance out his yin and yang. Jung said, know your dark side and accept it. That's the shadow. The shadow can be positive, not just a force of evil, but if it's repressed, it can have an evil effect. It can come out as destruction. The main thing to remember is that the shadow side is equal in power to the good side, and there's always the two of them in anyone. Existence is dual. That's why you have yin-yang symbols. Jung's great opponent in the world of psychoanalysis was Sigmund Freud. Freud was totally rational and scientific. Jung was much more for letting it all hang out, which is why Jung is thought to be more of a romantic. In the Jung cosmology, good and bad are equals that have to be balanced out, like a lot of other balanced out things, male and female, the earth, the air, light and dark. Unlike Freud, who would never do anything wrong, Jung's personal life was very shady. He used to get very angry, lose his temper, get into a rage, couldn't stand any criticism, and he would have affairs with his patients, long sexual affairs, which would be unthinkable for Freud. At least, you could think about it, but you'd have to repress it. After I've left this place, I'm going to meet a couple of killers. I know it sounds extreme, but, well, I want to use them to explore the Jungian yin-yang. First, I'm going to get some guidance from a Jungian professor. How does bad behaviour fit in in the Jung scheme, yeah. psychological scheme? Yeah. When, with real, sheer, outright naughtiness, what's the place of that? Shadow uh, aspects are so-called bad aspects which belong to us, but, but we would not like to admit them. Yeah. And the more you repress them, the more you're in danger to fall into the shadow. Then there are creative shadow types, like uh, Lord Byron. In the case of Byron, and in the case of many, many other artists and writers, it's not so much bad behavior which is rewarded, but, but bad fantasies. And as a matter of fact, art allows one possibility to admit shadow. In a way, the artist has that function of re-establishing a lost balance. Jung was against socialism, jazz, women wearing trousers, and any criticism of himself. And whenever he writes about himself, he's always amazingly prim and self-righteous. We don't hear a lot from Jung about his own shadow. We hear about a lot in terms of archetypes, but not so much sort of confessing up, well, I'm sorry I did that with all those women, you know. In fact, we have the opposite. In fact, he, he says, um, well, men really ought to have a lot of infidelity, because it's their right. <laughs> well... <laughs> uh, I think, like with artists, we should not identify uh, 
something some, somebody has written or created with his personal life. I think it would be rather snobby to say, well, he has behaved badly, so uh, what he has said is also bad. Hey, look, it's my own shadow self back there. What are you up to, Matt number two? Well, number one, I'm glad you asked me that. I've been looking at this old carving by Jung. The inscription on it says, Know thyself. You've got to face up to the dark recesses of the mind and not just believe you are what your conscious mind says you are, all good. 